This month on Book Break, we are talking about top summer must reads, and I'm joined in the studio by Jonathan Harvey and Jesse Burton. I'm Alex Hemmingsley and this is Book Break. This month I'm joined by two wonderful authors. Jonathan Harvey is a writer whose work includes award-winning theatre productions as well as TV credits such as Coronation Street, Gimme 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 and Shameless. His new novel, The Girl Who Just Appeared, is out this month, but more importantly he also won the Space Hopper Championship at Butlin's Pueli Patheli. Patheli. <laughs> in 1976. Welcome, Jonathan. <laughs> and Jessie Burton juggled her burgeoning writing career amidst careers in the city and as an actress. Her debut novel, The Miniaturist, which is causing quite the sensation, is out now. And welcome, Jessie. Thank you, hello. <laughs> also on this month's show, we join the author of The Unwitting, Ellen Feldman, to share with us all the secrets of her writer's room. And we'll update you on all the latest books that should be on all of your holiday reading lists this summer. So, guys, how? Hi, hi, hi. Hello. Now then, Jonathan, you've done all sorts. Your, your kind of writing career has been so varied, but where did it begin? Which discipline for you? I started off in theatre. Um, right. I, I, used, I was really lucky. I grew up in Liverpool, and the local theatre uh, had a whole season of plays by local writers and young oh, people. Yeah. And uh, at the end of that, they had a, and it was a pound to get in if you were under 18. So I used to go. And at the end of that, and it was really good stuff. There was a play called Watching by um, mm -hmm. Jim Hitchmer that became a sitcom. Yeah. Heidi Thomas wrote a play called Sham Shamrocks and Crocodiles, and she now she yeah. plays Cranford, and um, she, she wrote Cranford and created Call the Midwife. Mm -hmm. And so it was a really, it was a really, it was good quality stuff. And at the end, they ran a Young Writers Festival, and I entered, and I won the the top prize, and so I got yeah. a production on when I was seventeen. So <laughs> oh. it started about that. Way. And you still juggle different writing disciplines. I do. So yeah. how do you? How does that work? Are you do you sort of find you need to do one in order to do the other? It rests just, from each other. I just sort of have to plan really, and I think. Like, I, d I love writing for Coronation Street because mm -hmm. writing is such a lonely business, really, but there's mm. 18 writers on that show, mm -hmm. so there's a real support network. It's yeah. like going to AA or something. You're in a room yeah. with people who understand <laughs> what you're talking about <laughs> and have the same <laughs> mad thoughts as you. Um, uh, and, and, and so I'd hate to leave that because it gives me, yeah. it gives me a, a, a common ground with people, I suppose. Um, but I think doing other work informs that, and that informs my other work mm -hmm. as well. So as, as much as I can, I like to do lots of different things. Yeah, and now, Jesse, you're at the other end of the spectrum. It's debut time for you. Yeah. And how has that journey been? Do you have, like, hundreds of old manuscripts <laughs> under your bed, or was there this just, like, emerge perfectly formed in your mind? Oh, it definitely did not emerge perfectly formed. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be lovely if it did. Yeah, no, it just, it just happened. It was there. Oh, I've um, book. Yeah, First draft. Yeah, no, it's just <laughs> how it looked when I wrote it. Um, no, definitely not. I have actually. I just moved flat, and I found mm -hmm. all my old attempts, <gasps> and and I piled them up, and it came to seventeen manuscripts. <gasps> and some are, you know, super raw, and there's just yeah. you know, ideas, and there's notebooks everywhere. And yeah, it's a very, for me, it was a very sprawling, mm -hmm. sporadic, scrappy. And process. is it miniaturists in all of them, or were you starting off with you know international space stations or yeah. working class dramas? No, it used to be set on Mars, and then yeah, <laughs> no, it definitely had. A miniaturist always, right. um, but the identity of the miniaturist, even the gender, actually changed. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. And what surprised you about the process? Has you know, has there been an editorial bit that went on for much longer than you thought, or mm -hmm. something that was unexpectedly joyful? Or <laughs> there's been lots of moments of joyfulness, definitely. <laughs> more recently, like seeing the cover for the first yeah. time, and also knowing just how hard everyone's worked on it, like at the publisher at Picador, mm. it's just it's very touching as much yeah. as anything. Um, you realise how much of a gang. Oh, makes totally. It yeah, it's a whole industry, obviously. And, and well, I, I didn't really have that many expectations, so I mm -hmm. wasn't actually going to be surprised by anything because yeah. nothing really, I didn't know what to expect. Yeah. But, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, the editorial process is always interesting. Like, having mm. people kind of own your manuscript mm. is mm. interesting. 
Amazing. Now, Jonathan, tell us a little bit about the book you're here to talk to us about today, which is The Girl Who Just Appeared. The Girl Who Just Appeared. It's about uh, a woman called Holly who mm -hmm. is adopted. And uh, the, as the book opens, her, her adopt, both her adoptive parents have just died and she feels now is the right time to trace her birth family. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's from Tring, lives in London. Uh, but all she has to go on is, uh, is a bit of a birth certificate with her mother's yeah. name and an address in Liverpool. And on the very same day as, as her um, adoptive mother, funeral she gets a Google alert on her phone and it says that the flat that she was born in is up for rent so she sells her mum's house and she rents this property mm -hmm. in Liverpool and she goes there on the quest to mm -hmm. find her birth mother on the second day that she's there, uh, she finds under the floorboards a biscuit tin, and in the biscuit tin is all these papers, and it's mm -hmm. the diary of a 15-year-old boy. He's quite illiterate, <gasps> uh, from about 1981, going mm -hmm. through living in, the, in that area in the Toxteth riots, and um, slow. And it's, a, it's a sort of dual time frame. Mm. You're with Darren in 1981 and Holly mm -hmm. in the present day, as she tries to work out who is this boy. Is he related to me? Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, is he my brother? Well, and, yeah. and sort of try and, and find him and find her mother. And what were the inspirations behind those characters? Was it sort of just, did, did you, was it the idea of finding the box with the letters or was it a specific voice? Because Holly has such yeah. a kind of clear voice in yeah. it. I think, well, to be honest with you, the Darren thing I did write years and years and years ago. Ah. It was probably the first thing I ever wrote. I'd, I'd just read um, The Colour Purple and I oh. loved the fact there was loads of spelling mistakes. In yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> So I thought, well, I'll have a go at that. And I just put it away, and it, was only, it wasn't very long. Um, and I always knew I wanted to do something with it, but I wasn't sure what. Mm -hmm. And then I'd read quite a bit of Jojo Moyes recently, and, mm. and she does Lovely. dual time for us yeah. so well. Uh, so I picked her brains a little bit, and I thought, mm. I'm just going to go for it. So yeah. um, I still, so I, and I didn't know what the relationship was between them when I started out, and then and it, I sort of dawned mm -hmm. them as I went along, and I sort of yeah. burrowed a bit further. So um, the two time zones, mm. we've got Holly, it opens yeah. with a little bit of Holly in yes. 1981, which really like kind of parachutes you into yeah. the the sort of whole concept, um, and then you've got, and then it's present day Holly yeah. and Darren in 1981. Yeah. And how did that work? Did you have to kind of do your Holly narrative and then weave Darren in later, or did no, you, with, just... you like kind of John Michelle Jar style with all the laptops open, <laughs> doing all these different things? No. <laughs> I just wrote it like it's written, really. So I just so you, I thought yeah. it'd be. I, I mean, I think my soap background as well is, oh, let's get to a climax can, yeah. just before you go to to the past, and then let's leave the past at a climax. Yeah. And it, it, you know, I just wrote it that way. I didn't do too much planning. So, yeah, it's, it's, it was a better developed muscle from the idea, like, soaps have yeah. got their d different narratives of different cla yeah. characters going on. So yeah. you kind of, yeah, because the different yes, novelist I mean, who'd just done one narrative. I mean, I did go back at the end, obviously, and rewrite totally the whole thing when, yeah. I when I realised what my, what my twist was <laughs> yeah, to sort yeah. of incorporate that. But yeah, no, it, I didn't. And did do... you prefer writing one or the other? Did you kind of wake up thinking, oh god, another holiday? I, I suppose I really enjoyed doing the Darren stuff yeah. because I, all my novels have been first person female, mm -hmm. and this was my oh, first yeah. male character, yeah. so um, that was quite good fun. And also, someone. I just lost myself in that world, and I'm mm. from Liverpool, and, and just yeah. and, and I did lots of reading about the, the the riots and and Britain at the time, so I really enjoyed that sort of forensic stuff. Yeah, and there's a publishing question alert now. Yeah. <laughs> all your books, because you've published, this is the third one you've published, yeah. and they've all got quite a distinctive jacket. They look Ooh. like they they kind of go together. And is yeah. that something you had input in, no. or it's just a sort of happy coincidence? It's 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 the publishers choose that really. I was very happy with it. Um, it was, I think it was the first one was about a, a soap actress and they mm -hmm. wanted it to look a bit like a theatrical poster. Right, OK. And, and it's obviously become a bit different now, but yeah, yeah, that was yeah. the idea behind oh, it. That's great, because I always, yeah, the, the idea of being presented with the jacket and doing that sort of rictus grin. <laughs> oh, thanks very much, guys. <laughs> I really yeah. like that cover. Yeah, yeah that's very, cool. Very chic. Mm -hmm. Now then, we'll hear more from our guests shortly, and I'm especially looking forward to hearing about Jessie's book jacket too. But first it is the writer's room. This month we met up with the author of The Unwitting Ellen Feldman. Well, I've wanted to be a writer for as long as I can remember. I mean, the process of writing for me is great fun. It's sometimes extremely painful, but when it's going well, it's, it's so exhilarating. The Unwitting it was a political story, but it was also a story of a marriage. And I came up, somehow they came to roost in my mind, as a couple who were involved in the Cold War after World War II. It was 
a very secretive period. Secrets were kept, and this was the cultural Cold War. It was kind of another front in the Cold War that was fought not with bombs and bullets, but with words and ideas. And about halfway through this book, I found that I was really interested in writing about a marriage, and what holds a marriage together, what tears it apart, how people live with each other. Uh, they can love each other very much, but it's not sunny every day, and they can fight like cats and dogs and still love each other. Uh, so this became more and more important to me. As far as basing characters on people I know, I don't. However, the first scene in The Unwitting where he's humming is my husband. Every friend who read it said, oh my heavens, there's Stephen. <laughs> I work in writer's rooms in two libraries. One is the New York Public Library, which is a wonderful, massive building. It's one of the great libraries of the world. And there's a, there are three different rooms for writers, different levels. And uh, it's a small room with carols, and I work there. And then there's a small, sub, smaller subscription library, which is one you pay to join, which is old. It was, I think, the second library in the States. And um, they have a writer's room as well. And I go there, I walk there in the morning, and I walk home in the evening, and I prepare myself to write, or I unwind from writing. The other place I get a lot of work done is running. I run in Central Park. If I'm having trouble with a scene, I start to think about how to work it out, uh, plot problems. It, it's a one, you're isolated from everyone else, and, uh, and the best time, of course, for running is when you spin out or phase out and are not thinking about running. You're just in, living in your own head. I think that seemed like quite a classy, classic writing <laughs> yes. set up there. Highly stylish. The, yeah, very stylish. Yeah, really like the, the cardigan, the libraries. You guys, spill. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you write? Do you have to have, do you have special requirements or are you just happy on a train or a bus? My ideal is just to stay in bed all day with a laptop on my knee. That's mm -hmm. perfect, yeah. really. But I do feel like a dirty old <laughs> person. Um, <laughs> So I will often actually get changed into my writing slacks. Uh, yeah. Some I'll nice write anywhere, really. dresses. Yeah. I did actually go to the library uh, off Leicester wow. Square the other week, but I didn't really know what to do because I got a bit worried about going to the loo and leaving my laptop there and things like that. So every you time I went to the loo, <laughs> every time I went to the loo, I'd have to like, pack everything up. Uh, so I won't be doing that again. Right, and you can't you put loose women on. <laughs> Jessie, do you have such... Talk us through your anxiety. Oh, I don't know. I don't really have a routine. I mean, I, I like... I have to have silence. That's right. one thing. I can't... I don't understand how people write in with public music. with music yeah. or in a cafe. Oh, uh, yeah, no, white that noise is a requirement for me. Oh, yeah. my God, really? Mm. I just couldn't... I, I need, yeah, just silence. And I can, mm. I can kind of do it anywhere. Mm -hmm. Um... And I mean, I've sometimes I end up just writing on my phone on the train if I get an yeah. idea because I just always forget if I don't yeah. write it down. Yeah. Um, but I sometimes I do sometimes go to the library. Um, but when I wrote the miniatures, most of it was actually in offices in the yeah. city, secretly typing so away. So tell us, did you you had this idea? You still you were working in the city? Yeah. And Doing can what? you? Being a PA. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Writing a novel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really great PA. <laughs> yeah. Where are the flowers? <laughs> Do you remember the first, the pe kind of first pen to paper or pen to keyboard to mind moment? Was there like, I'm going to write a book? Or was it lots of little iPhone notes that suddenly started to merge together? Kind of the latter, really. I mean, I, I had written one novel before this that was a sort of, I never quite finished. But mm -hmm. then that was, you know, oh, I've got an idea. Yeah, I'm gonna mm -hmm. tap it out and the kind of same thing happened with the miniaturist um, yeah it, it was sort of stolen moments and sort of yeah. like emailing it to myself or writing it in my gmail account and then yeah, like yeah, cutting yeah. and pasting into a word document because sometimes kind of it's the the biggest recipe for disaster is to sort of clear your schedule oh, and yeah. say now for these three yeah, months yeah. i'm going to write an entire novel you just sit no, there you're going, setting mm. yourself up for a failure yeah. because it's just too much to ask of yourself i think and i have noticed that you know when i had um i suppose adversity in a sense like mm -hmm. i had to do other jobs to pay the bills it mm -hmm. made me so much more mm. hungry for it because it's like i just don't want this to keep being my life mm -hmm. um, and then suddenly you have more time and it's like oh god I've got to make my own discipline I've got to be my yeah. own disciplinarian yeah. That's, yeah that's a bit of a change was that, was that one of the biggest challenges then when yeah. when's this sort of time opened up for yeah you? defo yeah and what else? else what were there kind of do you have sort of because you're sort of living the dream it's first novel people are being lovely about it it looks great you get on with your editor it's the sort of you know the dream we're scenario really happy for you. <laughs> yeah we're all delighted <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
advice for people? Was there something that you felt like, oh, thank heavens I did that that early on? Or is there... uh, no, I mean, I, I, I mean, a lot of it has been, you know, immense good fortune. I mean, yeah. I just, I, I don't know. I do think you, I mean, I did get knocked back and I was rejected mm. and, I, and, and I just kept writing and taking advice from people who I yeah. thought knew what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, I suppose it is you up there, you know, and mm. it, yeah. it is your work and you have to be able to know what you're saying about it. Um, yeah. I, so I we, should, we should clarify about the book for viewers who haven't seen, read it yet. The Miniaturist, it's, um, it's a young girl gets married to someone, it's, it's sort of, what, what, 16, 18? Six. Oh, sorry. No. <laughs> He's got it right. 1686, uh, Amsterdam. <laughs> and, um, she's just got married. She's a well, very wealthy husband. She's still a teenager, yeah. and his slightly creepy Aww. gift to her. Yes. Well intended. Oh, I thought you said he was slightly creepy. Well, he, he well, does he, seem a little odd at first. Well, it's a strange cold house that yeah, she arrives in. Her, his, she has to live in. His yeah. sister is living there, and she's not tremendously warm. Not really. Warm no. And loving, and the servants are all a bit kind of secretive and he yeah. gives her this creepy gift yeah. of a miniature replica yeah. of her home yeah. yeah and then the little figures start moving around yeah they start the miniatures start sending nella is the main character's name mm -hmm. and she's 18 and uh she sort of thinks she's coming to amsterdam to sort of start things for real you yeah. know life as a wife you know Damn. i've got status Damn. yeah exactly <laughs> and it, it really doesn't work out that way and this house that actually was a real house um that i saw in amsterdam mm -hmm. uh it's kind of it's one of their sort of national prides it's just this beautiful oh, thing oh i see yeah. so it, it's not something you found in a junk shop in a corner no, it's no, a fabulous no it's a real it's a real house and i mean a real doll's house and mm -hmm. it was um it's about six seven feet tall mm -hmm. and it cost her the same as a real house to build and furnish and i was just in amsterdam for the dutch launch of the book and i was speaking to this art historian who's done an accompanying uh, real art book about the house right. and, and i said you know i'm telling people it costs the same as a townhouse does it is it kind of like the equivalent of a bungalow or something she's like no no it's like the equivalent of like two three four million pound <gasps> house that she spent on this doll's house and um yeah so this merchant johannes he gifts it to his his new wife and then the miniaturist she hires starts kind of breaking the rules and sending her things she hasn't asked for yeah things that nella starts to believe predict her fate mm -hmm. and the fate of her new family and it becomes a bit of a race against time to save them. And it kind of, it sort of raises questions of identity and how much agency you have over your own life. And yeah. it sort of manages to spiral out into interesting themes. Yeah. And did you, yeah, that was the <laughs> aim. It God. wasn't sort of like, oh, I've oh, got... you wanted it to be interesting. Oh, yeah. No, I, that was just my post-it note. That was my... <laughs> uh, and then, then some other stuff happens. <laughs> Yeah, and um, we should we should talk about the book jacket because you have an equally beautiful but very mm -hmm. different one because yeah. they, you know, you get used to sort of snazzy Photoshop and things on book jackets, but yeah. you, they did make they a did. miniature miniature house mm -hmm. and photograph it. Yeah, they hired a real miniaturist. Aww. Yeah. Well, and in, in the right. book, there's it's advertised, isn't it, the miniaturist? How yeah. does one find a 21st century miniaturist? <laughs> it fascinates me. I think they, they, I think they might. I mean, I don't know if they advertise themselves as miniaturists. I think they're model makers, or right. they might be like architectural yeah. model makers. But there are, there is a massive subculture of, of miniature makers and collectors, and ranging from you know English heritage and the V&A to, to to you know to home slightly, hobbyists um... <laughs> to people who who, who like miniatures. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's a strange world. I find myself in. <laughs> well, we have we've also had some questions on the book break hashtag this time. Very exciting. Um, now, are you ready? I've got some for everybody. Uh, Jesse Ruth Hunt says, uh, "Do you think that those who act have a deeper insight into writing?" Gosh, so I, inhabiting characters. Yeah, I, I would say no, no. I think <laughs> I think that you know, if if you're a writer, you don't have to have acted to be a, yeah. a good writer. But I think sometimes, I mean, acting is such a, a sociable, communal mm. thing, and I think it only really works when everyone has got a kind of mutual understanding mm. and generosity to one another. And and I think Jonathan was saying earlier, writing is very lonely, yeah. um, and it can be you know isolating. You can you can really see sometimes through other people's eyes you inhabit yeah. other people's minds um but then i i think you still have to write all the words yeah right? you still have to like <laughs> slog it out so yeah i think it has affected somehow like mm -hmm. some of my characters definitely and nina potel says are you on to book two yet which i would also like to know i am yes i'm about Mm, Thirty thousand words in, and okay. um, it's uh, it's a bit it's a bit different. It's actually dual time frame, which Ooh. I'm going to have to find JoJo really Morris. 
<laughs> yeah, I, yeah, read a few jokes. The yeah. giant. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very different because the miniaturist is three months quite a yeah, rapid yeah. little interior engine and uh, this is a bit different and it's uh, Spain in 1937. 1937 yeah. you say? And, <laughs> <the> date, <laughs> and London in the 60s, 67. Oh wow! Yeah so it's kind of wow. it's kind of you know late 60s things were starting to come apart really in the messy, kind of yeah. the, the utopia of immigration and and what people were feeling who'd come from colonies and, and in mm -hmm. london and, and, and how do you write so convincingly then about those times like about holland in the 1600s because i mean it's all right for my chose liverpool in 1981 but i was 13 and living yeah. in liverpool in <laughs> right? I, yeah. I, I, I feel like i've lived in amsterdam now that, but how, how do you go about do you have yeah. to do loads and loads of reading or um, read a, sort of about six history books mm. and it's just looking for like a little clue mm. like mm. how yeah. you know oh god they spent a lot of money on lobster or mm -hmm. oh they really like that spice cinnamon or mm. you know oh they buried their dead in the old church you just start patching mm. it together but I mean a lot of it is just imaginative and, and, yeah. and, and I don't know I think it did come getting, getting away with it <laughs> uh, we're gonna get really imaginative now Emily Finn also said if you woke up encapsulated in a miniature world what would be the first thing you do scream <laughs> yeah. Drink out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah no I mean that's interesting because I think that's like definitely a childhood thing in literature like if we were shrunk mm. honey I shrunk yeah. the kids yeah and the borrowers, borrowers. Yeah. yeah I would be scared I yeah. would be very scared that someone was gonna stamp on my foot would you go and stamp on me with their foot yeah oh. Yeah, I would just go and try and find protection and avoid mice, I think. Yeah, <laughs> on a more positive level, Chris McLaughlin says, if you could have a miniature scene from your own life, which one would you choose? Oh, that's so cool. Oh, I like that, yeah. They're good questions. That's, they're good yeah. questions. I, uh, this is a, probably a bit naff, but when I first saw my boyfriend, I think I would. Oh! Because he, we were in a Noel Coward play at the National, and it was his oh, first so it'd be role. really classy. Miniature. No, but it was—he was playing such a weirdo, <laughs> and he was so funny in it. And I just have this image of him. He was just—he was very funny, and he was holding this suitcase above his head, and I was just like watching. And I think that would just. That oh, would be cool. <laughs> now, Jonathan, we've got questions for you. Um, some somebody has said you write a lot about everyday life. Are you ever tempted to write about something else, for example, science fiction or a western? No. Okay. <laughs> Super exciting now. <laughs> Wincy Willis has <laughs> tweeted to <laughs> say, do your book ideas stem from script writing or does it happen in reverse? Ooh. Um, do you feel restricted in either one and think, no, that one's for a book writing day? Um, I think, I think, because I do lots of Coronation Street where there's, that's mm. so specific and where yeah. often lots of other people have come up with the ideas and I mm. haven't. If I have an original idea these days, I will tend to the first, whereas before I would have thought, was there a television series in that? Now I'll go, oh, ooh, do you think that's, the, do you is think it there's in a your book kind in of that? mental... Or I'll just go, right, I'm writing a book. What, what, what does it need to be about? What, yeah. what, what story do you want to tell? So they're quite distinctive, distinct. I think. Yeah, because I suppose you get to create characters afresh with yeah. books, whereas Coronation Street is, is it more so narrative it, and dialogue? The theatre and, and telly and film, you, you, it's such a collaborative process. Mm. You know, and if something, if something is crap, then you can just go, oh, that, act, that actress was rubbish. <laughs> but when you've written a book, there's no, there's no, there's no, there's yeah, nothing, yeah, it's just you and the no, page. Yeah. And it's, it's like, oh, yeah. I don't know. Well, somebody else who, whose blushes are spare has tweeted to say, why do you never respond to my tweets? <laughs> Yeah, Jonathan. Next question. Oh. <laughs> I'll tweet, Things I'll tweet aren't looking back. up for I'll that person. Back, no. <laughs> now, <laughs> well, it's well known that there ain't no party like a Pan Macmillan summer party, that famous saying. And we got our glad rags on and got down to this year's to get the team's recommended summer reads. Here is what the Pan Mac gang think that you should have on your summer reading list. My recommendation for summer reading is Mark Haddon's The Red House, which is a wonderfully deceptive novel. It's a book about families renting a house, going to stay together, and the fallout therefrom. And it's a very clever, beautifully written, touching book. So this is Power Games, which is the new book by Victoria Fox, and she writes really fantastic, filthy bonkbusters, but they also have a dark edge to them that I really like. The book I 
recommending is the sequel to The Ultimate Truth, which is called The Danger Game. It's about a young private detective called Travis Delaney struggling to find out who really killed his parents. I'm recommending Bonjour Tristesse by Francois Sagan. It's a brilliant little story about growing up set in the sunny Côte d'Azur. It's got romantic drama, scheming schoolgirls, um, rich and attractive French people, so it's got everything you want in a summer read. So I am recommending Station Eleven, uh, which actually isn't out until September, so you have to beg, borrow or steal a copy. It is a book about the end of the world, but really it's a love letter um, to the world we live in now. Okay, so I'm recommending When We Were Bad by Charlotte Mendelssohn. It's a brilliant beach read because even though it's set in London, so sometimes it's quite dingy, it's really funny, the characters are really engaging. It's about this huge, sprawling Jewish family. The mother's a rabbi of a liberal synagogue, and it's about her four children, two of whom are bad and two are good. I'm recommending Amy and Roger's Epic Detour by Morgan Matson. It's the perfect road trip read for the summer. Uh, two teenagers travelling across the US. Um, you won't put it down and you will wish you were in the sunny seas of the US. Bangle by Rainbow Rowell. And it is my summer read because it is an amazing book about finding yourself and new experiences and meeting new people and overcoming fears. It made me into a proper rainbow bangle. The book I would recommend is uh, Meeting the English by Kate Clanchy. It's the absolute perfect summer read. It's set around Hampstead Heath in the long hot summer of 1989. Uh, wonderfully constructed plot that will have you uh, gripped on your afternoon reading in the park. So the book I'm recommending is The Prince's Boy by Paul Bailey. Uh, and I'm recommending it because it's set in the world of Paris during the time of Proust. And he's, he's written it in the style of Proust. Um, and it's amazing because it's, uh, the prose style is Proustian, but the storyline is very much of the 21st century. The book that I'm recommending is Buckle and Swash and the Monstrous Moat Dragon uh, by Sarah Courtauld. fits alongside uh, How to Train Your Dragon by Cresta Cowell. It's a bit of Shrek. She's hilarious. It's really, really funny. The Italian Girl by Lucinda Riley is about a young girl who lives in Naples. And it turns out she's got this beautiful, beautiful opera singing voice. She is sent to Milan, her career unfolds. Uh, it's like, it's just the most wonderful story with romance and lots of spaghetti. And the, reading it is like eating a big box of chocolates. Thank you to the team there. Now, I've been allowed to go freestyle, guys. I've got my own summer recommendations in, and I didn't even have to stay with this summer. I've got Valley of the Dolls, mm. uh, which begat every kind of bonk buster that ever did follow. Uh, the Dud Avocado, which is basically Carrie Bradshaw in New York, except 50 years before Carrie Bradshaw. Not in Paris, 50 years before. I it's like super Paris. kind of ingenue. <laughs> yeah, I love Paris. Paris. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I had a lovely time in Paris on my honeymoon and everyone's very nice to me. Anyway, I still love novels set in Paris. And then from this summer, Catelyn Moran's first novel, How to Build a Girl, which is kind of, uh, it's fantastic and wonderful, but also a good starting point for anyone who thinks they don't like teen fiction, I think. I think there's such an amazing teen market and this is kind of effectively that and it's a, I hope that Have other people... It? Yeah, Have and I really it? loved it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Catelyn's tone is wonderful. so wonderful. But uh, yeah, those, those are my picks. Please, can I find out who and what is going to be on your Sunday lunches this summer? The Miniaturist. Ah! <laughs> what a surprise! <laughs> Anything else? Any, w w I, would, any? I, I just read the new Lisa Jewell book, and I would oh, read that yes. again. Uh, the Third Wife, it's called. That right. was really Ooh. excellent. Yeah. That, was, that jumped about in time, and the structure was really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think her stuff gets better and better. It yes. gets darker and more grown up, I think. It's yeah. fa fabulous. Oh, fantastic. Jessie? I'm looking forward to reading um, Landline by Rainbow Rowell because mm -hmm. uh, I read Eleanor and Park and I thought it was yes. amazing. And uh, Her by Harriet Lane. Yep. Everyone's talking about that. It's a really gripping thriller. Yes, I, yeah. we've heard that mentioned a yeah. lot. Uh, oh. Harry her, Lane. yeah, and she yeah. wrote Alice Always as well. And the other one I, I can't wait for is Sarah Waters' latest, The Playing Guest. Yes, I've Ooh. got my proof. Oh, you've got yeah. one. I, don't oh, I would have one. shared it with We need to move in with her, don't we? Uh, it's also set in a date I can't remember. Anyway. 1922, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, 1922, I've heard it set in. Really? <laughs> I think you're wrong. I, I think it is. <laughs> 
Well, we asked last month's book breakers, who I remember are J.B. Morrison, Tim Winton and Louise Miller, for their summer reads, and here is what they said. So, summer reading time is coming soon. Uh, any of you got anything that you're specifically looking forward to, either yet to be published or kind of something that you've been had on your to-be-read pile that you think's only got a chance on a sun lounger? Louise. I'm really looking forward to Harriet Lane's next book. She wrote mm. a very sublime sort of psychological suspense novel. And that's soon, isn't it? Yes. Her? Uh, yes, she, she wrote her. Alice Always and her is just yes. coming out and I'm really looking forward to that. And um, I also really enjoyed John Gordon Sinclair's um, thrillers that have just come out. There's yeah. one uh, called Blood Whispers, which I'm going to be mm. taking on holiday. Uh -huh. Jim, how about and, you? And uh, the new Will Wiles. Ah, novel, yes. Which I can't, it's, it's something hotel, I can't remember what it's yes. called. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I love this, his last book. Yeah. I think that's out, that's out in a couple of weeks, I think. Mm -hmm. Really Fantastic. looking forward to that. So it's something that you're waiting for with sort of bated breath rather than something that you've had in a big pile by the no, way. No, I haven't got it. And I've, yeah. I've, I've met him and maybe I could have asked for a copy, but I, but I don't, <laughs> yeah, like, to, don't yeah. like to do that. I'd rather buy Supportive it. Supportive fellow yeah. authors. Tim, how about you? Do you? Well, there's a terrific Australian writer called Richard Flanagan whose mm. new book is uh, being published, I think, in your summer, pretty soon. Yes. It's called The Narrow Road to the Deep North. Incredible book about... Um, uh, it's a novel about um, the survivors of the Thai Burma Railway. Mm -hmm. with so you've Japanese. read it and you're, yeah, no, you're both, nobly recommending both, to our viewers. He's a friend of mine, so I'm, I'm, I um, but also he's, we're both uh, shortlisted for the Miles Franklin, which is the, mm -hmm. you know, the Australian booker, and I'm hoping he's going to win because he's, he's never won it before and his book really deserves to win. It's, I think, the be best book to come yeah. from Australia this year. So that's recommendations there. Now, what are you guys up to next? Jesse, you're, you're finishing book two, but do you have international publications? Are you kind of yeah. going? Yeah, I think um, I'm going back to America. I think I might be doing a book tour there, so that's very exciting. <gasps> that's so, amazing. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think there might be a few other countries, but it's all sort of, I'm not quite sure when they're releasing yeah. the immunitarist. <laughs> <laughs> nice French accent. Yeah. Anyway, Jonathan, <laughs> what are you up to? <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm just... I'm about two thirds of the way through my next book, okay. so I'm concentrating on that. Right, but well, good answer for the for the yeah. publishers to hear. Yeah. Marvelous. Well, tragically, I think that's about all we've got oh. time for this oh. month. <laughs> uh, my thanks to my limited thanks <laughs> to Jonathan Harvey <laughs> and Jesse Burton for joining me here. If you want to get in touch with the program in the future, you can contact us on Twitter. We will answer with any book-related <laughs> questions, no. and if you want to find out about any of the books that Pam Macmillan published, you can go to their website, which is www.panmacmillan.com and if you want to re-watch any part of the show, an on-demand version will be available shortly. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and thank you for watching. Goodbye!